This past week was really exciting. A lot of time and effort and prayer has gone into the Jobs for Life ministry, and we had our kickoff on Tuesday, and it was just fantastic uh, seeing all the people involved with that, and Ken Smith has put together just a dynamic team, and I encourage you to ring the bells of joy about that, but also to be lifting that up in prayer and supporting that. I really think God is going to lead us as we strive to be out in the community to not just uh, offer up different things to help people, but also to bring about life change and transformation. Several years ago, I received a, a phone call from a couple out in the community asking to come by for counseling. I assumed it was kind of marital counseling. I said, well, I don't know you, but I'd be happy to sit down and talk with you. And so they ended up coming by. And she did most of the talking, and she was hearing some of the tension points that were causing friction within their relationship. And she said, basically, if you look at him, he's a disengaged father, not interacting with our, our son very much. He can't hold down a steady job, which always puts financial pressure on us at the end of the month to pay our bills. He said he hadn't caught, cut ties with his friends from the past, including some girls he used to date. And hardest thing is whenever I confront him about the things that he's doing, his standard response is, well, you know, I can leave. And she basically said that whenever the going got tough, he said, I can just walk out that door. Well, I, I felt kind of, I, they used to call it your dander getting up. I, I felt kind of uh, this heat coming up the back of my neck. And I, I was ready to just hit him with both barrels. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't want to cut off communication with this fella. So I'm, I'm, I want to kind of keep my cool. So here's what I said to him. I said, you know, when you get married, you go in with the understanding that you're going to stick with this person for better or worse, for sickness or health, or, you know, for rich or for poor, as long as you both shall live. Remember? Do you remember those vows that you took? And so I paused and, and waited for him, and he just kind of looked down. He didn't say anything. So I didn't know what, uh, how to follow up with that. And finally, the gal sitting next to him said, um, well, we've been together for a while, but we never got around to getting married. So what I talked with her about is, well, what we're dealing with right now is symptoms. Symptoms of a much bigger problem. And, and it's symptoms of that it, it's more than just uh, rings and wedding cake that you're missing out on. You're missing out on a foundation for your relationship, a pledge you make to one another and to God that you're going to stick together through thick and thin. And, and this is a foundational statement and it's a ceremony when you come together that's going to undergird everything you do. And without that, you're just playing house. And what we're talking about, some of the things that, that you're bringing up, those are leaks on the roof, but you have no foundation that you built this relationship upon. And he is exactly right. At any moment, he can walk out that door because it was never put together as God had intended. You know, we're just beginning a new series on life and community. And I think it's important for us because I, I really want to get to some of the marks of, of, of community and some of the things churches like ours do, do well and some things that we need to work on. But we first have to lay a foundation, don't we? We, we have to understand what the church is built upon and, and for us to understand that, I want us to talk about covenant and its relationship to community. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And this is a familiar story, but I think it's one that hopefully will help us. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2 says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is near. So here's John. He's the camel skin wearing prophet that uh, had been prophesied, you know, ab about by Isaiah. And he's eating locusts. And he's out there in the desert. He's this odd fella. And he's got this one message. The message is, get ready because God wants you back. You've been estranged for a long period of time. But God wants to restore this covenant. And that's going to come about when you repent. Get your heart ready because a kingdom is about to begin that's like no other. And there's a king 
like no other that's going to be leading this. And you've got to get ready because all this is about to happen. Prepare your heart. Repent to get ready. So his baptism of repentance symbolized kind of this washing away of the sins. He's like, you've got to set aside your old life so you can enter into and exchange this new life, this new life that Jesus is going to be ushering in. And so we voluntarily give up one to receive another, laying down the old way in order to emerge in the waters of the Jordan to walk anew. So that's what's happening there on the shore. Well, John had obviously been touched by God, and he had been set aside by God to bring this message that had been prophesied for so many years. And so he heeds the call, and, and he goes out and he preaches this message, and people are responding. And so all this is happening, and people have come out from Jerusalem, and they're standing on the banks of the Jordan, and, and this is happening. Some are buying in, and others are kind of a little more reserved, watching maybe under the, the shade tree, kind of taking all this in, and out from the crowds walks in the water. I figure that he instantly knows who it is. He knows what's going on, and he starts feeling this sense of unworthiness because he knows what's about to happen. Let's read him in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 14. John tried to deter him, saying, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So all this is happening. This wasn't what John uh, thought was going to be happening. And yet, here it is. God is, is ushering in something awesome. And it's happening today. And John says, I'm not worthy. He says, it's not about you. It's what God is going to be doing here today. And so all eyes are down on the water when this is happening. But the text lets us know that all eyes quickly went up into the sky. Because so, what starts happening? You guys remember? The clouds that day start parting. And I don't know what it must have been like, but it must have been, just been incredible. Maybe it was a light that came down. Maybe it's a voice. We, we don't know exactly what, it, what was going on that day, but we can imagine what is happening here. And so Jesus came up from the water. And here is what, what's happening here. As the skies open up, here comes a bird from the other realm. A dove descending like the one released long ago from Noah's ark. A dove that was sent out to seek hope for humanity and a safe haven for those in need on the ark, as we talked about earlier in our time of worship. Here's this dove, and here it comes. And it's symbolizing, the text tells us, the Holy Spirit. And the text tells us it settled and remained on Jesus. I love how the ESV says, it came to rest on him. There are times in, in Scripture where it says that the Spirit was with David or the Spirit was with Saul. We know that there are times where David said, don't take the Spirit from me. Now the Spirit has come to rest upon Jesus and it's not going anywhere. This is an incredible experience of heaven and earth coming together. This is what Mike Breen says. The heavens were rent and the two worlds were connected as the Holy Spirit descended and remained on Jesus. The Holy Spirit had connected this world with the world to come, as in that moment Jesus became the portal of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus becomes this instant conduit to this whole new realm. And so all that was present in heaven that he knows and, and wants to express to us, that's now coming down. and We get to taste and sample what he has known. And through the power of the Spirit... We start seeing what's happening. And Jesus' ministry is going to be marked this way. As he walks out of the waters and he goes through his time of temptation, he calls his disciples. People start getting a taste of what this kingdom is all about. And so we see in his ministry that it was marked by forgiveness for the sinner, care for the sick, relief from the poor, justice for the oppressed, and freedom from those that have been controlled by Satan for so many years. 
And so people are seeing a power. They're, they're seeing fruit of a ministry they've only heard about. And now they're seeing what this new kingdom is all about. But it's nothing they've ever seen before. And so the realities of heaven that are promised for one day are being sampled in this day. They're getting a taste. Jesus can't do for all, but what he, the ones he comes in contact with, what he wish he could do for all, he does for those that he, that he sees in that day. So the broken, the hopeless, the hungry, and the disenfranchised are now being invited into an offered community. Because the, the religious community wants nothing to do with them. And Jesus said, come to me. We're going to be doing things different around here. It was not just that God the Son and, and God the, the Spirit were involved in this credible scene. From the, from the heavens you also hear, Matthew 3 and verse 17, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. See, the incredible picture of the Trinity. You have God up in heaven that's saying this. You have Jesus in the water and, and the dove coming down representing the Holy Spirit. See, so the Trinity all coming together. This was a crucial point in our story. What happened in this day? It's truly incredible. And what God is telling the people there is, this is my son that's going to be living among you. And we, we later find out at the transfiguration, he adds and reiterates, Listen to him. Pay attention. There's been a lot of confusion. You've gotten the wrong message about me. You've gotten the wrong message about how to respond to me. If you want to understand the Scriptures, look at how they're lived out in the life of Jesus Christ. That's the Gospel message. That's what we need to be looking for. He is there to reconnect you with me. But this required a covenant. As we talked about with Noah, as we talked about with Moses, as we talked about, uh, Lincoln did a great job talking about Abraham. There was this coming together of God with his people that required this covenant. The covenant would require a death, for it to be lasting, a death once and for all. So Jesus understood this and is beginning the process. By him walking down into the waters of the Jordan, he's actually taken the first step towards Golgotha. He's taking the first step towards the cross. He's saying, Lord, I, I'm dying to myself and my agenda. I know what I was sent here for. This is the first step to begin that journey, to become this sacrifice, to be a part of this covenant. And so he knows that he's figuratively dying to his agen agenda, but he also knows it's going to lead to dying physically on the cross to bring us back to it. So in this act of submission Jesus says count me in I want to be a part of this covenant I want to be about reconnecting this lost people that were lost in the garden of Eden back to the father I no longer want them to be estranged and so he agrees to take on the sins of us all like the animals that had gone before you know the crowds didn't understand exactly what was happening they just think it's another person that maybe he's He's a good teacher or something. And, oh, that's kind of, he's being baptized too. John said, don't miss this. He knew this is a weighty act. John the Baptist in John 1, says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew where this was leading. He knew what this was all about. So on the banks of Jordan that day, the people are witnessing something truly incredible. Jesus is connecting with us. We understand that. And God made it clear that God is connecting with the Son. And, and so if God is connected to the Son and we're connected to Jesus, He becomes this instant conduit. And, and He says, I'm going to hold hands and bring these two parties together. That's what's happening here in this covenant relationship. Three points about this and the lesson is yours. Number one, as we talk about community, we have to realize that community requires covenant. You know, we, we can talk about theology, and there are a lot of people who like to sit down you know, around coffee and, and talk about religion and talk about different things, maybe even about the church. But until you've stepped up and say, count me in, I, I want to be a part of this covenant. I want to release my will like Jesus did in the water. We can't receive the blessings of the covenant baptism gives us a visible expression in our lives 
uh, of our old life that's being given up, saying, I, I no longer want that anymore. It hasn't brought fulfillment. Yes, I've been in control, but look where it's taken me. I'm ready to sacrifice that and say, Lord, I'm ready for the exchange. I'm ready to be a part and to be under your covenant, Lord. I want to be connected to you through what Jesus has done as we step into the waters of baptism. It, it's not just something that we do to be added to the roles of this or any other church. Not long after Jill and I were married, we decided that you know you, you start getting your own credit cards, your own bank accounts, and you, know, you get on your own health insurance. And, and we decided that we we're thinking about, should we join Sam's Club? And so people are telling us the, uh, you know, the benefits of shopping this big box thing. I, you know, I've been there a couple times. But, you know, you, you kind of weigh the benefits. And well, if you're willing to buy a uh, 1,000 rolls of toilet paper, you can save some money. And so, oh, okay, we'll store that in the guest bedroom. And so you, you, you hear about the benefits of this if you're going to go through this. And so finally, you kind of weigh this decision. Yeah, okay, count us in. What do we have to do? Well, we've got this area that we send potential members to. And so you go over there, and you have to fill out some paperwork and some different things, and they kind of run you through the system. And then, uh, then we want to take your picture, and so you get a, a membership card so you can start enjoying benefits, and you can start enjoying those today, and, and then we'll collect a fee, and then you're, you're good to go. And that's an annual fee you keep. Oh, okay, and so you kind of, I got to thinking, if you take out the fees, that's starting point, isn't it? For those of you who've been through, you come in, you fill out some paperwork, find out about the organization. Well, did the benefits meet my name? Well, yeah, it seems to make sense. Okay, we'll fill out this paperwork, we'll snap your picture, we'll introduce you, put it up on the screen. You're good to go, you can start shopping here at Twickenham. Baptism is not one more thing on the list to enjoy the benefits of coming to this church. That's not what it's about. It's a covenant relationship that you make with your heavenly father. What exactly is it? Peter asks us, he says, go back to the story of Noah. That's the best way I know how to do this. Help us to better understand. So in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, he says, for Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, not to join the church, not just because this is a socially acceptable thing to do, but as a pledge of good conscience to God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, powers, and submission to Him. This is a big deal. You're partnering with God. It's the resurrection. It's you dying to yourself, being buried and raised again. You're joining the Jesus story when we do this. It's being part of the covenant. A covenant that's been passed down. It's a thread that's gone all throughout scriptures. He said, you're joining that story. Scripture is not just about reading about some cool stuff other people have done. He says, I, Peter's saying, join this story. And this is how we do this. At some point, each of us have to say, Lord, I need you. I, I can't do it without you. Lord, I'm ready to die myself as Jesus did. I, I want to be a part of your story. I want to live for you. I, I know I'm not going to be perfect, but this is a pledge of good conscience, Lord, that I want to live differently. And by the power that you're going to give me in the Spirit, that's going to happen. You need to know that the Lord seals his covenant with the gift of the Spirit present in our life. And so this is a relationship that we join into with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But don't miss this. Baptism also has a communal dimension. Because your baptism, you're introduced into the body of Christ. You're joining with other brothers and sisters in Christ. This isn't a thing that a transaction happens between you and God and just kind of go on your way. No, you're joined with other brothers and sisters in a covenant community. A community like you can't experience anywhere else because these are people that have also died to themselves and given their life to Jesus Christ. 
That's what this is about. And so we join in a community together. And you covenant with the community to walk, not perfectly, but differently. The, the, the second thing that we need to, to wrestle with is community advances the kingdom. And we need to be careful here because community, as a, the, the church, what we experience and the things going on is not the same thing as the kingdom. Church is not the only tool that God can use to bring about change in this world. In, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, it mentions that a contingency of Pharisees and Sadducees were there on the shore. They came out from Jerusalem. They walked all the way through the desert to get down there by the Jordan to watch what was going on. They heard about this commotion. They said, we want to come out and see for ourselves what's happening. The people there, or their people, were confessing sins and being baptized by this outsider. See, John was the antithesis of everything that they stood for. If you think about it, they're there in their fine robes, as, as John points out. He's there in a leftover skin of a dead camel, okay? He's just out there. Kind of an interesting way to look at things. They worship in the temple. John is out there, and he communes with God in the desert. They're sticklers for right action. Make sure the external's all right. John's preaching a right heart. This inner transformation. So you've got this instant tension that's going on. But what's sad to me is presumably they watch and see what we just read. They're witnesses to what just happened. Are they excited? Oh, I've been working with this family for years. God finally got them. Their hearts are broken. They're being baptized. Well, let's celebrate together. No. No, they were upset. Because they were worried about who was doing the baptizing. They said, if, you, if you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah, then you need to hush because you don't have any credentials to be doing what you're doing out here. See, the Pharisees and Sadducees were in the business of religion. And, and, and John is cutting in on their territory. So instead of looking upward and seeing what God is doing, this inbreaking of his kingdom has been promised about for thousands of years, and God says it's happening today, they missed it. They missed it all. I, I hope that we understand what's going, because they were protecting what they had. My, my prayer for us is that we become more and more a kingdom-minded church, and please don't get me wrong, I don't want to diminish the role of the church. I just don't want to limit the ability of God to work in different ways in the kingdom. You know, the community of believers stretches beyond the Twickenham camp campus. And, and the times and talents and treasures of our members advance the kingdom beyond what Twickenham does in their efforts. Uh, Todd mentioned what the great work going on in Outback in a couple of weeks. I've seen life transformation. I've seen the fruit of that ministry it, it, is that on our budget sheet? No, but a lot of folks are involved in it. Great things are happening through that. Brothers, uh, Art Leslie ended up going down and spending time with Mark Thompson, going down to Nicaragua. And they were there, and they went to go do some work with some preachers and, and some uh, ministry leaders and Bible class teachers. They were all gathered together, about 140 of them in one place, and they went down through a thing called Latin American Ministries. Don't know anything about Latin American Ministries. Should that bother me? No, I, I know Art, I know Mark, and I know their hearts. And praise be the Lord that God is doing something in Latin America that I know nothing about, that I don't have to control, I don't have to bless. I just say, I'm going to pray for you guys. Go share what God's doing in your life. And think what that's going to happen with 140 people going out across Latin America, sharing what God has done in Mark and in art's heart. That's what we got to be about. It doesn't have to be about us to be of God. That's what it wants to get. And, and finally, community calls others. This is tremendously important for us to understand. Jesus not only expects us to covenant with him and, and to make a commitment to the community, but he also expects us to reach beyond our community to those that need God's community. You know, just as the, the heavens open up and, and we talked about how that God is reaching down to Jesus and Jesus reaches out to us, it's important for us to be holding one hand with Jesus 
the one hand out there with people that you come in contact in your neighborhoods and your schools at work that are floundering. Tell them about Jesus. Go home and look at 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, and say, Lord, help me to be able to say this with those that are searching. I want you to follow my example as I'm trying to follow Jesus. I, I want you to connect. I want to connect you to the person that has changed everything in my life and made my life right with God. That's my calling, is to be so in love with Jesus that I want to reach out and say, can I be this conduit? Can, can I connect you to the power that's transformed my life? For this to happen, two things have to happen. Relationship. We have to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. That has to be strong has to be powerful, has to be something we're renewing each and every morning. We have to have a relationship with people that don't know him. It's, it's such a temptation for me in my life because I love hanging out with you guys that this becomes my only community. I, I've got to be out in the community too. I teach a class over at one of the colleges. I, I'm, I, I coach soccer and do different things with that because it gets me out in the community. It forces me out of my office. It forces me out to connect with different people people that need to hear the gospel message. I've got to be building relationships so that I'm a credible witness, as Paul says, to follow my example as I'm following the example of Jesus Christ. We've got to connect with others. Okay, well, wh what about this gospel message? Are, 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 are they going to believe it? Well, how do we convince them of the gospel message? Well, we go out into the world like Jesus went out into the world preaching the gospel. And see if this sounds familiar from our story today. With the Spirit resting upon us, our ministry is going to be marked. Are you ready for this? Forgiveness of sinners. People will experience among us. Care for the sick. Relief for the poor. Justice for the oppressed. And freedom from the control of Satan. That's what people will experience if they're among us. The Spirit is driving our ministries. The Spirit is engaged in us and is transforming us. People will come and, and say, this gospel must be true because I can see the fruit that's coming out in your life. I used to know you. Mike, you and I have talked a lot. It, it's, it's hilarious because the past two years, it's fun meeting someone that just, just gets to know Christ and he and I were kind of talking and, and he kind of let out an expletive kind of cussing and stuff and and I'm like, you know, but he was using it to, to talk about how wonderful Jesus was. And I'm like, I love new Christians. Isn't this great? But watching how you've grown and developed and what you and AJ mean to, to Jill and I in our community, it's watching what God's done in your heart. That's incredible. That becomes a witness because people know the old Mike and know how he's grown and developed and what Jesus Christ is doing in his heart. That's all he talks about. That's all he's reading about. He's, he's ordered his life around Jesus Christ. That becomes your witness. That's the fruit of what Jesus is doing in your life. That's what God is calling us to do, to authenticate the gospel message. Well, the realities of heaven that one day that we'll all feast upon are being sampled now. People should be able to get the taste of what we'll be feasting on for eternity as the kingdom is welcomed into our campus. That becomes our covenant community. That offer of the covenant community to invite others to experience what we've experienced through Jesus Christ and the good news. Well, there's an invitation this morning. If you'd like to come. This morning, if you'd like to enter into that covenant community, you've, you've never done that. You've talked a lot and it, but you've never made that step saying I, I want to be a part of this outward expression of what God's doing in my heart I want to partner with Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism I want to receive the Holy Spirit the invitation is there we would love to baptize you this morning if, if you'd like the Lord to open up your eyes you, you've been a Christian for a while but you just want God to say lay on my heart what in the kingdom I need to be doing I'm going to pray for you I, I want our shepherds to surround you and lift you up saying, we've got someone that's willing to go out and, and do something either here locally or internationally, whatever. I want God to be able to say, Lord, I'm, I'm ready, use me. Come, we'd like to offer prayers. Or perhaps on that last point we talked about, extending community, God puts someone on your heart that you're thinking, they need to experience what we experience. 
And Lord, please work in their life. If you'd like to bring that name or just say a co-worker, come forward, share that so your brothers and sisters in Christ can lift that person up, that they can experience true joy that comes from being an eye with Jesus Christ. If you have any, come now as we stand and as we sing. Oh, Lord, God of